Hello, I am Sir Patrick Moore. I first met Arthur at a meeting of the British Interplanetary Society. I just joined it at the age of 12. Arthur, of course, was 17, five years older than me, but we struck an immediate friendship and it went on from there. We never, we never lost it. Well, because he came up to me as a fairly old and was immediately very friendly, so I took him. He, he was just like that. And we had the same interests and the same outlook, I think. Well, one day we'll be very happy because we're going to go out into space and set up first research bases and later, I'm sure, self-sustaining colonies on all the planets. We will be becoming a space-faring civilization. And I think that's as important really, as our emergence from the sea half a billion years ago. Of course, during the war, we didn't see each other. We both joined the RAF, but he was on the ground radar, and I was flying up there, so we didn't, our path didn't cross again until the end of the war, when the BIS reformed, the ones that else came, we, we, we teamed up. Well, the first law, when a distinguished but elderly scientist says that something is possible, he's almost certainly correct. If he says it's impossible, he's very probably wrong. Uh, on the whole, I think well, he was a good scientist because there were other, other better scientists. And as a fiction writer, he's in a class of his own, really. So I think I would describe him essentially as a fiction writer and of course as a visionary. And he saw many things that have come to pass. Communication satellites being one, he was the first to see that. So, um, I definitely a visionary who looked, looked into the future and generally got it right. He got some things badly wrong. He thought we'd, we'd be on the moon right now. But uh, on the whole, he was pretty well, pretty nearly right. I never write anything which I know is scientifically erroneous, although I have made one or two errors through carelessness or ignorance on occasion. I sometimes extrapolate from known science into plausible science. I usually have a note at the end of the book pointing out to the innocent reader, you know, this is not yet known to be true, but it might be true. We are always in touch. He lives in Sri Lanka. I could have, I'm here, of course, but um, we didn't meet in London or we used it by, by television. So we talked on television very, very often indeed. What sort of things would you discuss? Well, either just casual, friendly conversation or very often set up interviews with papers or journals. We wanted our views on that, so that happened very regularly. We ring up and say, well, with daily so and so, they want chats with you and half the clock. We can you anytime you like, really. So we set our televisions up and there we were. <laughs> you will probably laugh at me here. One of the early ones we was The Sands of Mars. He never liked it. I thought it was jolly good. And I don't think I read anything that he liked best. Oh, I didn't like it, I didn't like it at all. Well, I, he was there, he's a definite visionary. He went rather more into the realms of speculation of science fiction than I would. But they've got the same basic ideas, I think. I thought, on Earth, we'll last here for a long time unless we destroy each other, which we may quite easily do. I wouldn't be a bit surprised, actually. The worst danger now comes from ourselves, you know, not from the sun or supernovae or anything like that. That's our worst danger. And we've so nearly done it two or three times. Uh, I think more as a visionary than as a writer. And there are other very good science writers. I um, don't think anyone quite matches off, but they don't nearly do. Because when you think of the great science writers of the past, you go back to H.G. Wells with people like that. So I think Arthur's in the same class. But as a visionary, well, yeah, he's really in a class of his own. I'm all in favour of protecting Arthur C. Clarke's heritage. After all, he did so much for astronomy and for the world, so I'm all for it.